The idea that, that psilocybin is anywhere near the level of abuse potential of cocaine and methamphetamine and many of the opioids is just preposterous. I mean, yeah. we don't even know where we're caught up because it runs so deep. You know, the conditioning runs so, so deep. I've had participants that are, you know, combat vets that say this has replaced combat as the most intense experience of their life. But there was an age where the rabbi was the healer. To get to world peace, I think we need people from other religions to sit in the medicine together, to sit with these plants together because they're known to dissolve boundaries. And right now mm. we have a lot of like walls and boundaries that may not even be real between us. It's causing us to not see ourselves in the other person. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. So welcome to a special episode of the In Search of More podcast. I'm sitting here with three previous guests of the podcast. Danny Resnick, the host of the Getting Out of the Way podcast, and uh, someone who works a lot um, helping people integrate their psychedelic experiences. I'm sitting here with Dr. Matthew Johnson from John Hopkins University, who studies psychedelics, and Rabbi Harry Rosenberg, also a previous guest of the podcast, who has uh, done a lot of work and continues to do work on um, demonstrating and finding the Jewish roots in uh, psychedelics and uh, helping to bring this to the world and make it more accessible. So I think that may be the uh, common theme of everyone here at the table. So uh, welcome, uh, welcome everyone. How you doing, Danny? I'm well, man. Thank you for having me. It feels to me like you have a question for Dr. Johnson, so I'll... Uh... I've, I've met, <laughs> met so many. Let's see it up there. Oh, if, uh, yeah, so... Um, one question that kind of came up was uh, your work with delayed discounting and how that kind of relates to your work in the psychedelic space. And if you see a uh, correlation there and if you could just kind of, you know, provide some. Interesting. So, yeah, thanks for, you know, you, you've looked into, yeah, my academic background beyond the psychedelics. I appreciate that. Um, so delayed discounting is refers to some of my behavioral economic work that's you know, kind of in the spirit of understanding addiction and some other problems like this idea that people differ in their devaluation of the future and that's typically looked at by um, how people devalue money so because pretty much everyone treats money as a, re a as a rewarding reinforcing event you know at least you know human adults and so you can ask them questions like would you rather have five dollars now or wait a month to get ten dollars and and have found and others have found in the field that that's highly tied to addiction, whether it's tobacco addiction or heroin addiction, cocaine, you name it. So I have looked at that in some of the psychedelic work, um, including the, our, our first study using psilocybin and magic mushrooms to help people overcome a tobacco addiction. I didn't see a shift there. Small sample size, so that's a limitation, but Actually, in the progression of my work with delayed discounting in, in other areas, I've, I've actually come to the conclusion that money isn't always the best reward to use to study phenomenon. So uh, some of the other work I've done is applying this, this delayed discounting model to study sexual risk in terms of questions such as, would you wait hypothetically to, to use a condom to delay a, a sexual encounter situation to have safer sex rather than having immediate unprotected sex. And in cases where, like when you put people on drugs like cocaine and alcohol and methamphetamine, drugs associated with sexual risk, you find that, that um, even though the discounting of money when they're high on those substances, their decisions about whether they take $5 an hour or wait for $10 don't change on average. But their decisions for this kind of sexual risk version of delay discounting. Would you wait to have your the preferred option when all is being equal? These are people saying they'd rather, if they're gonna have sex in a casual sex situation, they'd, they would rather use a condom and it's just in circumstances, under less ideal circumstances, like when they don't have one, that they might do something risky or have sex without a condom. So I found that with that, there's something that I've called domain specificity. So you can't just take how you treat money as a reward and, and use that as a proxy for someone's trait-like tendency of how they value the future and, and, and all circumstances. So 
with that lesson um, in some of the work, and we haven't analyzed it yet, but in our current work study with using psilocybin to help people quit smoking, we've looked at some of these other constructs, such as um, whether people are, uh, um, how they, um, there's a phenomenon, for example, called social discounting, which is instead of looking at uh, time as a dimension, it looks at social distance. So if you have so much money to share between yourself and others, how would you distribute that amongst you and people that go down a rank order list of like, say, the person closest to you in the world might be a spouse or someone like a family member or a friend. And then you go down the list to, you know, like a hundredth person, you know, which might be an acquaintance, that person you say hi to, but maybe you don't even necessarily remember their name and how, how that affects, how that social distance affects your valuation of like how much that you would share with them essentially. And that follows a very similar, similar mathematical form that the kind of the further you get away from yourself, the, 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 there's a hyperbolic drop off in the degree to which you're willing to, to share. And there's other constructs such as like the discounting back to time, like, you know, whether you would take improved, a small amount of improved health now or larger amount of improved health, health later. So I don't have the answer yet, we're, but we're going to be analyzing some of those outcomes because drawing from this sexual risk work and, and work that others have done in the field, such as finding that with people with obesity and food addiction problems that their discounting of money is like is normal, but their discounting of food is extreme. So again, domain specificity. So stay tuned for the answer, but we're going to be looking at some of those results with this currently finishing up, wrapping up study, much larger study, to see if some of those other aspects have shifted. Because people don't come out of a good psychedelic session saying, man, I've got these great new investment ideas, or I'm going to do... It, it, is, it can happen, but typically those aren't the domains that are on their mind. It's like more integrative, you know, like you know, things like health, things about social, you know, how you value other people in your life, how you value your own health. Those, those seem to be like, like more the dimensions that might be pushed around by a good experience. So we'll see. So I don't have an answer yet, but hopefully we'll. Yeah, it's super interesting. Uh, looking at it from the standpoint of uh, psychedelics, it seems like when people have done the research and they're kind of ready to work with uh, some of these plant medicines, they almost want to immediately get it done. But if they have to follow a certain protocol that delays their ability to access the plant medicine, it mm -hmm. almost seems like there's a greater buy-in. And as a result of that, the results of their experience seem to be more uh, meaningful and, and deeper uh, because they have to kind of, you know, follow this pathway to get to the point where they're finally going to you know, work with the psychedelic. Um, so yeah. that's why it was interesting to see if there's kind of a, a crossover between those two kind of fields of uh, understanding. So interesting, yeah, and I took your question, the direction I went is like, does the psychedelic experience affect your discounting? But that's more of the temporal discounting of the psychedelic experience yourself, which is a fascinating way to look at it. And you're right. I mean, I, so I haven't formally looked at this with the analyses, but that strikes me as absolutely true. In fact, I tell people, like, sometimes there's this debate over, like, say, with ayahuasca use of whether you have the so-called dieta, you know, so, oh, you cut this out a week or two weeks, and there's all sorts of different formulas. And, and some, some people go off on the scientific angle of, like, saying, oh, that's all a bunch of BS, and, you, you know, there's no theoretical reason for that. And I, you know, I step back and say, like, let's not be so judgmental, because, you know, that... Maybe at the surface level you may have a point, but in fact what these people are doing are saying, I've got my eyes on something really important that's coming up. And I'm going to prepare for it. And I'm going to prepare for that. And whether eating aged cheese or not makes a difference, it, it, every time you open your fridge and, and you say, <laughs> I'm not going to choose the, the aged cheese or whatever it is, the want, you know, you're bringing your mind, you're keeping your eyes on the prize, and, and that's meaningful. You're sowing the seeds. I'm going to do something really big in my life, whether it's a month from now, a week from now, two weeks from now. And that strikes me as very meaningful and certainly connected to the you know, various faiths where, you know, fasting or restrictions of one form or another. I mean, there may be a surface level story and, you know, but this is kind of underlying all of that. 
you could probably pick something relatively arbitrary in, in life to say, I'm not going to drink out of like clear glass, you know, whatever. It's just very arbitrary. But there could be value in that because if, if you associate with that with some important goal or meaning in your life, it kind of brings you there. It's a form of meditation. It's a, a form of reminder where you're, you're giving up something for something that's more meaningful. So I, it strikes me just anecdotally that that's very important. And in fact, that is the standard advice for, um, for good reason, and there's science on this, for helping people quit a substance, like, like say quit tobacco smoking, that you know uh, you could decide just on the spur of the moment, say, you're, I'm going to quit, I feel inspired, but research shows that your chances of long-term success are better if you set a goal, like, I'm going to quit a week from now. And, I'm gonna, and that's what we do in our research with psilocybin to help people quit smoking. We set that quit attempt, which is actually the, their target quit date is, on, is the day when they You find that that works better. Yes, yes. Now, with the, you know, I haven't done control conditions where we treat people immediately versus not, but the smoking cessation literature in general really supports that. And, and, and it makes sense with this whole concept of like, yeah, keeping your eye on the prize and you're building towards something important. But anecdotally, as someone who would say, I'm stopping to watch porn tomorrow is likely never going to stop watching porn. That, that would be overstating it, you know, because so there are people that, um, you know, make an on-the-fly decision and it works. I don't mean and, that. And it I may mean depend that, on the... I mean the decision in the moment, like I'm done with it now versus I'm going to be done with it. Right. Like, it I, sounds like a much stronger... Yes, yes. It's, it's, there's reason to think that... that if you actually set that goal in mind ahead of time that you're going to have greater long-term success. However, this may differ on the, on the substance, you know, and the activity. So for example, let's, you know, hey, if you're in a pattern, you're dealing with alcoholism and you're in a pattern where you're drunk driving every day, it's like, yeah, you don't want to go through another week of drunk driving right. and risking <laughs> killing people in yourself. Yeah. Um, and so I, I want to be very cautious and like not telling, you know, mm -hmm. if you really feel inspired to make a change in your life that's positive, I'm not strongly encouraging people not to. Cigarette smoking is one of those things that might be a special case where there's no, you know, de I mean, look, smoking for the next week is not in any realistic sense going to affect your long-term odds of heart disease. It's whether you're smoking for the next year or five years, 10 years. Right. You know, and even let's say if you're struggling with pornography, it may be, hey, your wife catches you and it, during that next week and it might really cause a problem for your marriage. So that may be a case where someone does want to take that inspiration and quit on the fly. So you know, there's some nuance here that I don't want to make any, you know, overstate any, any case. So Dr. Rich Strassman, I saw in his, <clears throat> his book, he was saying how the trip really starts when you decide to take the trip. Mm. So he said, the second you agree that you're going to do this, then then the trip starts working on you. And I think it was a little bit like what you were saying before, is the process to wait for it. There's still something very great happening in the mind. So even if someone says, let's say, next week will be my last cigarette, then all week long he's already in this mode of quitting where it's like kind of like pump braking, because when you're in a car, if you slam on the brakes, it's yes. considered dangerous. You're supposed to kind of pump the brakes on the car to stop. That's short. a beautiful analogy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you are quitting. Even if you haven't quit yet, you are in the process yeah. of quitting. Yeah. I guess it just depends on the personality type of the person. If he's strong enough to stop in one day, maybe not every human is. Like certain cars are built that they could slam on the brakes and stop. But <laughs> right. Maybe 90% of them are like, that would be dangerous for that type of car. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it would depend what someone said, right? If they said, I'm going to stop smoking in the next couple of months, that's very arbitrary. Yeah. Next couple of months. Got to set a heart Versus, like... I mean, pretty much everyone wants to stop smoking at some point. Right. Yeah. And it's, that's why, actually, when I've done a lot of research where you expose people to addictive substances and there's ethical guidelines, one of which you don't expose someone to an addictive substance, whether it's tobacco or cocaine, that they've never had before. But another one is you have to make sure they're not a treatment seeker. In other words, if they're struggling over quit, you know, quitting, like you don't want to continue to encourage their use over something they're struggling. But they say, no, I don't have any plans to quit. But, you know, then 
like, hey, yeah, better to do it a couple of times with us where we can learn something about the nature of this addiction, learn something about potential ways to treat it with a physician on hand, with taking pharmaceutical grade you know, products safer than anything you're doing out there. But in doing that, you really you can't just say, oh, do you plan on quitting? Like, because everyone wants to eventually quit cocaine, and everyone, not everyone, but right, it has to be specific. High percentage. Everyone wants to quit smoking. Do you have plans in the next six weeks to quit smoking? Oh no, like okay, that's what. Because <laughs> okay. if you say someday, like everyone, <laughs> almost right. everyone will say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to quit. <laughs> From the scientific um, literature, these saying like cocaine is addictive, right? Heroin is addictive. Mm -hmm. Some of these psychedelics, psilocybin, like ketamine, um, we've spoken about earlier. I know, I know people who have addictions to ketamine. So yeah. how, how are those quantified? How are those qualified? That's, that's an important uh, distinction. So the classic psychedelics is a group pharmacologically that includes psilocybin, LSD, mescaline, which is in peyote and San Pedro cactus, et cetera. Um, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which is on ayahuasca, ayahuasca, those are all, they work in the same basic way in, in the brain. There's variations, but they all primarily affect the serotonin 2A receptor. And differences between them are more shades of difference rather than qualitative differences. And with those, we're really confident that they're not addictive at every level of science in terms of like the way they don't affect the brain reward sy system, the limbic structures, the way that opioids and cocaine and even you know, cannabis does to a, a more milder degree than some of those others, but they don't have that effect in the brain reward system. Probably more importantly, behaviorally, we know that even in animal models with all of those compounds, you know, you can train a rat to, you know, press a lever and they'll get the injection of cocaine or opioids or in the under more limited circumstances the right um and they'll the demonstrate THC. addiction to that yeah they'll, they'll keep pressing it so they'll show an addictive pattern but um so this classic psychedelics they'll typically look like what's called a punisher rather than a reinforcer in other words if the rat presses it once and gets that injection and gets the psychedelic effect it tends to avoid that lever like rather than <laughs> yeah yeah and so and then from the large-scale epidemiology, meaning the surveys, and with that work, you have to be careful to some of the older surveys and some of the current ones still, like they'll lump in things like PCP and ketamine, which are in the same general family, with the classic psychedelics, and even MDMA, which is not a classic psychedelic. And and so, so sometimes there's nuance because some of those are addictive, but if you really boil it down to the classic psychedelics, there's really not a credible signal. And I've Frankly, after 20 years of studying it, I've never heard a single credible example of someone really struggling over, you know, still, you know, mushrooms or LSD. Now, someone could use them in a dangerous way, like, oh, you know, someone might say, I, I drove around town with my buddy and we were tripping and wow, that was dangerous and that put people at risk and like, yeah, right, like that's, that was a bad thing to do, that put right. yourself, that was a, you could call that abuse, you know, or misuse. But it's not addiction. No one's like jonesing for their next hit, telling themselves, "Got to keep doing LSD, and I got to stop." Like, um, okay, tonight's the last night I'm going to do mushrooms, but tomorrow I'm going to quit. And then you tell yourself the same thing tomorrow, and then the next day, you know, these patterns happen with you know, in you name it: alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine, opioids, cannabis. You just like I've never heard a single example of that. It, typically, if someone takes a classic psychedelic on a daily basis, it's because they've done it on a dare, a college student. And usually they have to like double their dose every day for it to even have an effect. So we know very well. Now, ketamine does have some, it's no cocaine. Is it working you know, on a different receptor? Yes, it, it, it works on the, it's an antagonist at the NMDA receptor, which is a, another receptor system in the brain. Um, and there are some downstream effects that, of the classic psychedelics and the the NNDA antagonists like ketamine. And so that may account for their, some, there is some overlap in terms of how they feel and, the, and their effects, but they, some people can get into a daily use habit and develop a problem with it, um, ketamine. Less so with MDMA, and it's really hard to tell. It's, MDMA is kind of difficult because the, what's out there, and I've done some of this research, is really dirty. A lot of it isn't even MDMA. The stuff sold as Molly and, and, and ecstasy, um, you know, and when it is real MDMA, it often has other stuff in it, like has some methamphetamine in it, has some K2 
cathinone compounds, which are called the so-called bath salts, which are, you know, amphetamine-like stimulants. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of hard to say. But MDMA seems like it has some mild addictive potential, but not like the psych- the classic psychedelic are like over here in terms of addiction potential. They're at the at the at the extreme end of like they don't appear addictive in any way, shape, or form, and we're very confident. And some of the others, like ketamine, again, they're not like the opioids or cocaine, but they're somewhere in the but middle. But they're also not like the classic psychedelics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ketamine might be sort of in the category of cannabis of, yeah, uh, in terms of its addiction potential. That's, it's impossible to really... Can we refer you know, to them as anti-addictive, the classic? Yeah, yeah, Not only are they I think not addictive... So. They get you out of some of your addictions. Right. So and, it's like and even farther on the spectrum. And that happens surprisingly frequently, aside from the research with alcohol and, and tobacco, and there's a bit uh, on cocaine now that's, that's emerging. Um, there's these, I've done several, you know, uh, surveys that I've published, frankly, early in my work with tobacco, where I was presenting to people some of my early findings, and folks would come up, sometimes at mainstream scientific conferences, and folks would say, sometimes very quietly, hey, this happened to me, like, you know, they say, <laughs> I took acid back in, you know, 73, and I just, I quit smoking. I just thought, what, what the hell am I doing? I quit the rest of my life, and, or I quit drinking, or I quit doing this or that, and, and I decided, oh, I need to collect these stories. So I collect, I, I publish these surveys, and it doesn't prove it's not the level of a randomized clinical trial, but stories of people saying that they t- typically took these things for fun or for curiosity, you know, not with a therapeutic intent, not to quit, like, with the substance, but... You know, they took, you know, mushrooms or, or acid, you know, what have you, but they, you know, quit, ended up quitting or substantially reducing um, opioids, cocaine, methamphetamine, alcohol, cannabis, tobacco. Stories with all of those were people, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I have a, a good friend that's, that struggled with years with alcoholism and he said he took, actually he was, I think, already drinking and he took a you know, 10 strip of acid. He just took a bunch of LSD and he walked the railroad tracks all night and said he was just done drinking. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, these... So many yeah. of those stories. Um, and given, given the kind of anti-addictive properties of these classic psychedelics, um, you previously, like 2018, recommended the rescheduling um, down to Schedule 4, right? Where, right? where do we stand with that process right now? Well, and, and the... And what it was really tailored towards is if psilocybin is approved for medical use by the FDA, if it passes phase three trials, that's going to prompt the rescheduling question. And if that happens, how should we reschedule it? And so the answer to that was schedule four. So that really depends on it getting to that point. Um, and so I would say the evidence really suggests that that's, science really suggests that's where it should land. Any other argument such any other argument, including in, in trying to get that paper published, I had some review, scientific reviewers saying, oh, how realistic is that? That doesn't seem likely. It's, it's all political. Yes. It's like, okay, and, and maybe reality might land there, but this is science, and so we're going to play the science game. Let's, with a radically honest look, going back a half century, what everything we know about psilocybin and its abuse liability as defined by the Controlled Substances Act, what does the science suggest? And I would say we landed at Schedule 4. I'd, I'd say it's probably arguable whether it should be Schedule 3 or 4. But certainly, by no stretch of the imagination, should it even be Schedule 2. I mean, I mean, that's where methamphetamine and cocaine are. I've done research giving those to people. I know what that's like, you know, you know, seeing it with my own eyes, what those drugs do. You know, I focus on the dangers of those drugs and, and how to minimize them, how to help people dealing with addiction to those. And... The idea that that psilocybin is anywhere near the level of abuse potential of cocaine and methamphetamine and many of the opioids is just preposterous. It flies in the face of all evidence. Now, what might happen, which I really hate, is that it it may end up being a bifurcated schedule. And that's a term that's been used more and more. You could consider THC sort of on a bifurcated schedule, meaning if it's approved Marinol, it's, I believe that's in Schedule 3 now, so approved THC. I and mean, that's that was approved in the 1980s, and so not controversial at all. But if it's whole plant cannabis, according to the federal government, it's Schedule 1. 
but it's the same active primary compound that's treated differently depending on what form. And so a drug actually did research with GHB, which was kind of was popular in the club drug scene in the 90s, the rave scene. Um, it, uh, it's a sedative. It's more alcohol-like than psychedelic. Like some people have likened it a bit to ecstasy. I think it's, it's more sedative-like. But it was approved on a bifurcated schedule because it's approved for the treatment of something called narcolepsy, so cataplexy associated with narcolepsy. People that have such problems sleeping at night that they fall asleep spontaneously during the day. It's a very rare disorder. But, um, but it, if you have a medical supply of the drug, it's considered schedule, I think, three. But if it's anything illicit, even if it's the medical product, but it's off, you know, you weren't prescribed it, you scored it on the street, which as far as I'm, I know has never happened because they re keep really tight control of it, it's considered Schedule One, which flies in the face of the Controlled Substances Act because it's supposed to be about the inherent properties of that molecule. Like methamphetamine and cocaine are Schedule Two, not Schedule One, because there is limited medical use of those compounds. And so it's about, it's not like if you're caught with like cocaine, oh, it's okay because it's Schedule Two. Like that's still very much illegal. But it's almost like the p politics of, well, it sends the wrong message if you put it, the illegal an illicit version of it in, in anything other than Schedule One, But then we could also get into the critique of the Controlled Substances Act in general, which I think for a number of reasons just doesn't even make any sense. I'd be all for revamping and even getting rid of the CSA and replacing it, but that's a different conversation. That, that paper was written in the context of with the existing system, where should it plug in? Interesting. And so if you had to kind of apply a timeline to this process with the ex like exclusion of this bifurcated scheduling, what would, you, what would be your best guess in terms of when we could potentially see some progress made? So with MDMA is the most immediate example, um, pro potentially within the next year, the MAPS group has completed uh, two phase three trials with MDMA for PTSD. So it hasn't happened yet, but all of the evidence suggests that a very li high likelihood, given the results that have been made public, um, that, M that the FDA will very likely approve MDMA for the treatment of, treatment of PTSD. And again, that's poised to happen probably within the year or so. Um, psilocybin, probably a few, two or three years behind that. The leading edge of that is probably depression. And then with alcohol and tobacco addiction, maybe a bit behind that um, by a year or two. So that's speculative because those haven't entered into, well, certainly there's no phase three research that's been completed on those, but, and, and phase three is the, using lingo here, FDA lingo, but phase three is that final phase of research that the FDA needs to make a yes or no decision based on the safety and efficacy. In other words, does it, is it safe and does it work? to heal the thing you're trying to heal, you know, in order to, you know, prove it as a medicine. So we may be just a very, you know, a few, you know, just a few years away from MDMA and psilocybin being approved for, you know, a number of disorders. Um, Pretty incredible. When it is approved, let's say MDMA for PTSD, if someone is struggling with anxiety or depression, their um, medical professional thinks that this can help them, that would be available to them as well, right? I believe so, under off-label use, and we are getting into the realm that is, uh, you know, my expertise is a, uh, you know, psychological science and you know the clinical trials and everything. You know, not the the, the legal aspect. I try my best, but I believe that off-label use that it would not be possible to constrain the off-label use. But again, don't quote me. It's so much about with ketamine, right? Most of the studies are around depression. Yeah, yeah, so it's approved for depression, and ketamine's an interesting case because the, the form that's FDA approved for depression is a product by Johnson & Johnson, um, and it's actually one of, the, one of the two. You have a left-hand and right-hand molecule, and it's w only one of those, and the racemic mixture, which is like the, both the left and the right being in a mixture, that's generally what people call ketamine, and that's what's been used in anesthesia um, for decades. And so a lot of what's happening is off-label use of ketamine, but also then there's approved use of Spravato, which is the name of the S-ketamine product. 
um, the Johnson and Johnson product, um, and and so you have off-label use of traditional ketamine, which has been approved for again. Um, anesthesia for years and years so they just use a dose that's like 10 times less than what it takes to knock you out and it's a very psychedelic dose so Rabbi Harry you were excited to meet um, Dr. Johnson can you share uh, some of the reasons why yeah I'm very <laughs> excited um, as I mentioned before you know one day I was just in it, innocently scrolling on my social media and I see a targeted ad looking for rabbis to participate in a study <laughs> and uh, I thought it was so interesting. I didn't know the details or anything. But a like, psilocybin study. Yeah, psilocybin yeah. study. In religious professionals. Um, and not that it was, uh, you know, something that I would have even considered doing or not, but I just felt like I had to call to learn more. Yeah. And um, I was always saying prior to that, to get to world peace, I think we need people from other religions to sit in the medicine together, to sit with these plants together, because they're known to dissolve boundaries. And right now mm. we have a lot of, like, walls and boundaries that may not even be real between us. It's causing us to not see ourselves in the other person. So I said, if a rabbi can see himself in the imam, and the imam in the rabbi, and the pe and this is the most powerful thing we could be doing on the planet. So I saw the work that you were doing, not just something cool to see how religious people think about God before and after. I was like, this is much bigger, because we call a rabbi a rabbi because the root word of it is rov, which means many, which this one man is a representative for the many. Uh -huh. So if this rabbi says something, guess what? There may be a million people who will follow his ways. Yeah. So I saw a lot of significance in the work, but I called and I applied and they said you'd have to spend a few months there. My, <laughs> I had a wife and kids at the time, so it wasn't something I was able to pull off. But um, my main questions, like, because I think about this very often, I'm sure you were able to see it, is when you make concentric circles and, you know, in the Venn diagram and you start mm -hmm. to put like, okay, we got a Jew and an imam and a, and a priest and a pope. Is there central spiritual realities that are just clear across the board that you could say, hey, you're wearing this outfit, he's wearing this outfit, but you're both saying the same thing. And now that you're in the medicine, you're able to see that that same thing is the big thing and the outfits are very small things. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's something that we'll have to keep working on. Um, the, the study, you know, to, to sound like a nerdy scientist about it, doesn't have nearly enough power to really address that, which you'd really, to even come close to really addressing that, you you would need, I mean, we were lucky to get one Iman um, and, and in the study. And so there's, you know, a few representatives or one from a number of major traditions. And so we don't really have the st statistical power to really address those questions, but, you, but sort of you know, anecdotally, it seems there are some reports consistent with that. Now, that said, as you could imagine, there are some pretty open people to begin with, relatively speaking. But there have been, there were um, some folks that did report that they saw more value and some truth in these other religions and, and the kind of the scholarly term for what's being described as the perennial philosophy, the idea that there, you know, different faith traditions are are um, pointing towards one core truth and that there's sort of one, you know, the human animal itself, which has shown up in many places on the planet and has developed many culture, different languages and traditions that the, the religions that have developed are kind of developed around some of that core interface of the human with reality and so that similar lessons and, and truths are gotten at by the tradition. Now this is debated in the in the science, the, the psychology of religion and um, folks like Ralph Hood have argued for the perennial per, perennialism as the, as the as what's going on and others have argued against it. Um, but there's at least anecdotally folks that um, that yeah will say things very consistent with that that they have really even with relatively open-minded people to begin with you know to being willing to do a study like this that they um, yes it, their eyes really open to the value and what other people are doing and, and gets less judgment around other faith traditions yeah, it's just two things for me is one is I don't know if this is like too metaphysical or not But you look at nature and you see the mushroom acts as like a connector for 
you know, the trees and mm. the earth, it's like the internet, or so it passes messages along through this mycelium network. Yeah. So I'm wondering if it's the same thing with humans, if we consume these same spores, does it cause us to start becoming more connected in the same way it would connect two trees on different sides of a park? That's really interesting, and certainly it's been argued, and I, it sounds right to me, I mean, with the caveat that, like, these experiences are so out there, there are many lenses that mm -hmm. really seem like really good descriptors, but I tell you what, like, just increasing connection, connection to yourself of what's meaningful to the core of the self, connection to your loved ones, connection to humanity, to being a member of the human speed. It seems like that, with good psychedelic sessions, that's really jacked up, I mean, mm -hmm. powerfully. And so it's really interesting to step back and see these natural patterns. It's like, is there something more than coincidence to the fact that yeah. they really do, like fungi connect different, I mean, they play this vital role as connectors in the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, and even like the death, like the, the decay of the forest and the, the regrowth of the forest and fungi are the big player there. And so it's like, you had to extend the analogy. And it's like, oh, interesting how psilocybin can, in the right circumstances, ease the, the existential dread of death. Yeah. You know, they sort of like, is there a connection there? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, you know, perhaps. Is there any methodology within the scientific community that can kind of qualify and quantify the mystical aspect of these experiences and uh, even further out the spiritual and religious kind of uh, touch points that we seem to be kind of embarking on and experiencing individually and collectively? Is there anything that could actually, you know, put this into various categories and buckets? Yeah, the, the kind of the most mileage we've gotten, and I'd say with all of this, we're in our infancy, and so we have far more to figure out and to do um, as, a, as a science and as, a, as, as humanity, but the, the, this construct of this so-called mystical experience, which is formulated by William James 100 years ago, father of American psychology and others, and Decades later, Walter Stace, who developed the, the construct, this idea that there are commonalities to these extraordinary human experiences, prompted by any number of things. I mean, principally outside of drug use, but including drug use, but whether it be through fasting, prayer, meditation, acoustical techniques, you know, substances, or just out of the blue, that, or some you know, like near death experiences, that there's a like remarkable. Breath work. What's that? Breath work. Breath work, yeah, through any number of techniques that there are some remarkable commonalities across these extraordinary experiences, a sense of unity, expressed in different ways, whether it's feeling at one with God, one with the rest of humanity, one connected to one's community, transcending time and space, a sense of ineffability that the experiences was beyond words, and a positive mood to the experience. The, the idea is that... Um, those core elements tend to show up, you know, what in these experiences, whether they show up in this or that culture, in this or that century, you know, in this or that language, that there may be like a commonality there. So we, we've developed scales, I say we as the science extending back over 100 years to William James, we've developed scales to assess that and colleagues and myself have, have psychometrically refined some of that you know, some of that, uh, you know, one particular scale mystical, mystical experience questionnaire. So it's self-report, and so that's the best you can get at at this point, is, is you ask questions, and you ask it to thousands of people and kind of refine, see which questions kind of overlap and what seem to be kind of moving and grooving with each other, which is how this questionnaire psychometric development is done. And so that's kind of, and, and we do find with some of these disorders that the mystical, degree of mystical experience is measured on their session day, like basically when the drugs mostly worn off, but before they go home, we have them complete the questionnaire. The degree of mystical experience is related to the decreases in depression and anxiety in cancer patients six months later. It's related to how successful they are in terms of quitting smoking um, six months later, et cetera. So there seems to be something about the nature of the experience that it's not just getting, and, and, and I should say, that relationship holds up even if you control for statistically how strong they thought the drug effect was, the intensity of the experience. So it's not just having a strong drug experience, like getting hit over a sledge, 
hammer with the head. Like The mystical experience is healing, that's what you're saying. Yes, it, it appears to be. And that's not a perfect correlation, but it's amazing that any aspect of subjective experience is related to those long-term outcomes. So it seems to be like, in terms of understanding that mystical experience, that there's something there to this experience. And what percentage of uh, participants, given your insight, would say that their experience did have some type of mystical or spiritual kind of tinge to it? Well, we, we find that, uh, that the, in, in a variety of, of studies that the majority of participants, so in some studies, like 60 to 70 percent, will have a, a so-called wow. complete mystical experience. In other words, reporting a strong effect on average across all of those domains of the experience. And it's not a black or white thing, even though we've often used an arbitrary threshold for a complete mystical. Sometimes you might fall a little short in one category. It doesn't mean there wasn't anything valuable there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable because this type of mystical experience, it's been studied in the population in general. And it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon in terms of someone's lifetime experience. Like if you survey the population, a, a decent portion of people will say at some point in their life they've experienced something like that. But in terms of something that's reliable, like I always like to think of it this way, in terms of something you could schedule for next Wednesday, <laughs> like, like that's going to be one of another way we've assessed this. It's not the same exact thing, but it's correlated in terms of what's a meaningful experience, like what would might be in the top five meaningful experiences of your life. You know, the majority of people get will You say, guys measure that, right? That, that, yeah. that came from you. Because I've read that in books, but that came from you. Right, right. That, that was cool. the Hopkins research that developed that, that, that scale. Of, so what um, is the number of people on average that say that a psychedelic experience was one of the most five most meaningful? So across different studies, so that would be the majority, 60 to 70% in That's different unreal. studies. You know, so... Yeah, and again, like something like you could schedule for next Wednesday or Thursday. It's just, you know, and we know that those experiences, like if you talk to people that have overcome alcoholism, that have overcome great traumas in their life, often it is an experience like that. And this is the type of thing that standard psychiatry and psychology, you know, you might work for some with someone for years and they never have one of those aha moments. Sometimes they do. But to have a technology, and, but often when people report quitting, even without professional help or overcoming their trauma, like they'll report an experience like that, like this experience of the where they had one of these aha, insightful moments of the of the world, and just the whole idea again that you can schedule that, like that, like no, it's not a guarantee; it's not a hundred percent. But even if we're talking like sixty, seventy percent, like you're probably gonna have something like that next Thursday. <laughs> like, and we can tie that to you, like trying to quit this thing you've been struggling decades with, like quitting smoking. Or like, that's a powerful technology. It's humbling that you could do that. You know? I'm thinking for a lot of uh, religious people, whether they're Jewish or Muslim, you know, Protestant or anything else, that hearing this may actually alienate them, mm. may make it in some way less accessible saying that, um, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for healing. I'm not looking for a spiritual, mystical experience. I'm not looking for a new religion or a new God. But it could also compel others as well. It really depends sure. on motivation. Yeah. Right. I mean, being that I speak to a lot of Jewish people, so I'm just wondering. That's especially true in Judaism, because if you look at the writings of the Lubavitch Rabbi, when people wrote to him and asked him about uh, taking LSD, his answer implied that this is absolutely not something we do for spiritual growth or gain. But for the sake of healing, basically, and almost anything's fair game. Like mm, healing correct. someone precedes like anything. So for healing, it's like the most permissible act. But if you feel healed and you're just looking to experience divinity, it would seem like certain rabbis would say it's not worth it. Right, but if the research is showing 60 to 70 percent of people are going oh, to have yes. that experience, and it's also saying that Let it be a byproduct. It seems to be correlated. <laughs> but it's not a byproduct. It seems to be correlated, right? The it's mystical spiritual experience seems to be correlated with a longer lasting effect. Yes. Now that said, the, the, the mystical experience is nominally divorced from any supernatural belief system. So, you know, Richard Dawkins, you know, the, the, the you know, 
hard atheist could easily, you know, and, you know, he hasn't been in one of our studies, but if he was, I wouldn't be able to tell you, so I guess you're still on your toes. <laughs> but I guess mean, because of confidentiality. But, you know, he could totally score like a full mystical experience, but have no belief in God, no belief in... It, it's about your experience. Like during the experience, did you have a sense of oneness? Right. And it doesn't have to entail God. It can... So it Sam is Harris something... Has that. Sam Harris has on YouTube, I saw it. I think it's called Sam Harris's Mushroom Trip. Mm, and it's a 20-minute mm -hmm. video where he talks about his mushroom trip. And he doesn't sound like an atheist when he's describing his mushroom trip. Yeah, mushroom trip. yeah, but yet he is. Have you heard that? It, uh, I don't think. I've, I've, I've read some of his books, and so it, I'm right. not sure if it, and a bunch of his podcasts. So I'm not sure if it's a clip from something right. I am familiar with. But I've heard him yeah. read and heard him talk about psychedelics I think I remember yeah. one line on there. He said that there was a distinct feeling that there was a there there. Mm. <laughs> I think that was a line from And some of the... Talk. The dis, you know, where you go with that may have more to do with, um, Thank you. with what? With identity, because if, uh, yeah. you know, if it's a big yeah. part of who I think I am, it's very uh, difficult to undo that foundational belief system, even if I am, let's say, experiencing this kind of one-off mystical experience that might yield this connection to divinity or oneness but if it's so ingrained in me that i am you know this and that it's it, it, you don't want the rug pulled out from under you so quickly so right um it's it, it's a challenge uh it's a challenge and you may not have a frame i mean you might be part of a faith tradition that or you might be attracted to a new faith tradition that provides some that fills in some of those blanks and somebody you know and other people may not one any of those blanks filled in. Then the experience will feel like it's filled in or someone else may fill that in for them, a guide? Well, I think it's important for, at least from a secular perspective, and this is where the, this would be the role of other people in the person's life. It's not the, you know, if you're talking about s s secular psychedelic therapy, I, I think it's important not to fill in those blanks for people, but to let them drive the bus in terms of metaphysical But are they possibly, because I'm thinking I've had some experiences where it felt like I was communicating with a rabbi or mm. uh, you know, by a rabbi or something Jewish may come into my um, vision. And I wonder if someone Christian would have an experience more of talking to Jesus or something like that. Ultimately, I always hesitate with these things is I'd like to see the study where we randomize the, the you know, a hundred Christians <laughs> and a hundred Jewish people and, you know, et cetera. Right. And then we like, you know, but more anecdotally, so my, my friend and colleague Peter Hendricks at University of Alabama, Birmingham, he's doing a work to treat cocaine addiction. And, you know, the large majority of his participants are African-American, you know, Bible Belt, you know, Baptists, et cetera. So he's using um, psilocybin to treat the cocaine Yeah, addiction. psilocybin, I'm sorry, to, okay. to, to treat cocaine addiction. And he's, he's telling me there's a lot of Jesus experiences. Like, that's a lot of Jesus experiences. Which is not surprising, and I think that, you know, it's, you know, I, I, so clearly a people's identity, you know, can can fill in those blanks. And not that it's, that's not to say that what you fill in with is, like, not real, but there may be different ways to interface with these ineffable, and maybe a lot, a lot of faith traditions are different ways of dealing with the in, ineffable, you know, the thing that is ultimately the the mystery that can never fully be described. Like you could call it God, call it, but there, and some people are okay with kind of sitting with that and leaving it a mystery and not filling in the blanks at all. And some people, you know, people name. differ on that, right, I sure. think. Yeah, so conditioning basically has a large role to play in how uh, one experiences uh, psychedelics and how one integrates them post-experience. Uh, post it seems pretty clear that, yeah, that that's the case. I mean, if you're into, you know, chakras and this, you know, like, hey, don't be surprised if you have, you know, experiences of chakras sure. during the experience. And, yeah, and so, I, you know, and I... 
And that's why the word surrender has such a big role to play within these experiences, because you have to be able to, well, you don't have to be, but uh, it may be beneficial to come into an experience as, uh, as open as possible, ready to surrender it all, surrender the conditioning and the identity and all of it to get mostly like a clean experience uh, that isn't influenced or colored by, let's say, background or various uh, personal influence. Um, so, yeah, right. surrender is something that, uh, you know, it's a word we keep hearing in this space, and rightfully so. And it's so much easier said than done. Oh. The, the, the we do it <laughs> to find out where we're caught. I mean, that's why we're, you know, working some of these uh, plant medicines. Um, yeah. Because we don't even know where we're caught up because it runs so deep. You know, the conditioning runs so, so deep. Yeah. And, 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 and the idea, like, once you start explaining things and we tell people, hey, you know, put the th that keen intellect of yours, like give it a day pass. It can visit some of the museums <laughs> yeah. in Baltimore. Yeah, good luck. And all of this is easier said than done, right? Yes. But if, if it just has somewhat of an effect, if they can spend a little more time absorbing, we say focus on that absorptive part of your mind where you're just collecting experiences and you're going to think and describe afterwards, right. but during this experience you're just collecting the experiences. I do think you can, yeah, it's not black and white and you don't, if someone starts describing in real time, you don't tell them to shut up. You know, there's an art to us, sure. you know. You know uh, but you encourage them to kind of go back in and keep working with it. Because it, the idea is if you start describing things, you kind of kill the thing. You, that's right. You, you, you dissect it into pieces and it's no longer the thing. But yeah. that's why preparation is so critical and that run up to the experience needs to be kind of um, really thoughtfully designed to allow people to start to, um, you know, as you identified, even the concept of doing the ceremony is already the beginning of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And if the if the protocols that are designed in terms of preparation are designed thoughtfully enough, we can start to surrender before we go into ceremony. And that's really, really kind of critical, especially from you know a researcher standpoint, to make sure that the output is as uh, true and clean as possible. Um, but that, that preparation process is so, so critical because I've seen people just by taking themselves seriously and following a proper kind of onboarding uh, protocol start to notice that some of the conditions that they're trying to kind of work through start to dissipate just through that process alone. You know, just through yeah. diet, sleep, and exercise, we recognize that, oh, I'm feeling better, I'm thinking better. Well, of course, I mean, right? It was your lifestyle that potentially got you into the jam in the first place. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's hard to kind of just isolate the ceremony itself Mm -hmm. Without looking at the pregame and postgame, which is you know the setup and the integration, so Definitely. it needs to be kind of, in my opinion, just a more kind of robust lens that we use to uh, structure the experience pre, during, post. And I'm often reminding people, it's like, yeah, it's it's amazing enough. It's a relatively relatively discreet intervention. You need, you know, you kind of get results that sometimes look like, oh, you could have someone in therapy for a year or years and you may not get these results. So, you know, but it's not that day, you know, as you're saying, right. it really is. And and I think part of the preparation, even in a, you know, clinical trial setting, um, you know, you're telling people in, in the informed consent process, I sit down with people and one way to describe it is I try to scare the bejeebus out of mm -hmm. them. I mean, there's, you know, I'm like, I tell them, as I mentioned uh, to you earlier, Ellie, like I tell people that I've had participants that are, you know, combat vets that say this has replaced combat as the most intense experience of their <laughs> life. Like, I don't know what that's like. I'm describing things that are well beyond my experience. Like, like you need to have some humility. Like, you can really feel you're dying. And if you say, oh, well, I'm not that type of person, I, I usually... I, I typically hold, the, you know, I'll be okay. Like, no, no, we need to talk some more. <laughs> like, you may be humbled, you know, and and so you, and we're not going forward unless you, we really feel that you're, you're, you know, like, yeah, you can have a really, you may be in that position, and you need to be prepared for that, and 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 so that that process begins. I mean, just by like, what other clinical intervention in psychiatry, psychology? Do you, do you say, oh, we're going to go, you're going to have this experience and you may literally feel like you're dying. You're like, you're not going to die, but you could g genuinely believe that you are dying and I'm going to be the person to hold your hand 
and, and, and work with you through it and be with you. Like, what else is that extreme? Like, talk about a leap of faith. Like, just saying, okay, yes, sign me up. Where do I sign the consent form? Right. That's this leap of faith that, you know, that, like, it, that, it doesn't show up anywhere in modern medicine. I mean, maybe, like, being willing to go into surgery, you know, but you're unconscious during that whole thing, and so it's a little different, but I'm totally putting my life in your hands. You can go in literally into my guts and... It's kind of, in a sense, even more intense than that. Like, cause you're going right. to be alive during. I mean, you're going to be awake during this, and the struggle is going to be in you. You're the pilot. It's not like me taking this organ out or sewing this up, where you're just oblivious yeah. to it. Even getting someone to buy into that mental concept, they might check the box and say yes. But these experiences transcend all concepts, and so even though you can, mm -hmm. you know, kind of initial and say I'm in having that type of experience, um, you know, just completely obliterates what you thought you were buying into in the first place. Which is another thing I tell people. I tell people that routinely I have people come back after the experience and tell me, you know, that whole talk you gave me at the beginning, <laughs> like you didn't even come close right. to describing it. So in the spirit of informed consent, how, like how do you truly, like part of that is just doing the best you can. It's like, so I tell people even that, it's very meta, like I tell people that people come back and say, you could have never de des have described what I went through. So if you're not willing to sign up for something knowing that you, you don't may know what not it is. even be capable right. of understanding which, like that in and of itself is part of it. You have to be willing to take that leap of faith. And so they, I think that it's like the healing starts. What do you feel like, like is there. motivating? Not feel like maybe you you see it. Most of the people signing up to these clinical trials. What are they? Why are they coming? Why are they going through the process? Different reasons. Uh, so some studies are to treat something like to them having uh, anxiety and depression around their cancer, or they having depression you know, outside of cancer, or struggling with tobacco addiction or, or these healthy normal studies. So I've done studies with colleagues, like just studying people without a problem, but just understanding what are the effects of psychedelics? What's, what's the nature of this mystical experience? What do people think? What are people's uh, you know, neighbors and But specifically on and, someone who's not outwardly struggling with anything. Right, right. And, and, and some studies where even um, I've, I've, the connoisseur studies, like a, the, the work with dextromethorphan, the ketamine relative, where we compared that to psilocybin, and also the work where we we worked with the active agent and salvia divinorum. Those were studies where I wanted the psychonauts, like the people that were experienced psychedelic users who can give me their feedback, who could say, oh yeah, that was like the time that I took you know 2CB and I smoked DMT at the peak of the experience. There was a little like that, but it was also a little like the time I took, you know, like, you know the connoisseur, you know, so even those people, so people come in with various you know, reasons. A lot of the people in the healthy normal studies where we don't want a lot of, a, a lot or, or any psychedelic experience and the therapeutic studies, a lot of them are in the category where they were, they were always fascinated by these things. Maybe they've read a bit and they've seen some things on documentaries, but they, or, or they were interested in high school. Sometimes there are people, you know, baby boomers who, for whatever, their friends did it, but they never tried psychedelics because you know, legitimately, they're like, yeah, it wasn't safe. I was concerned about going crazy or like, you know, I, I didn't feel comfortable enough. But since this is like, you know, a hospital and there's doctors here and this is all legal, like that kind of satisfies my concerns. And so there's a lot of people in that category. Right. right. Always curious, but the conditions weren't right. 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 And now they're willing to do it. And um, you said yeah. something interesting. Ellie. You said, uh, these folks who aren't kind of outwardly manifesting any symptoms or conditions that they're trying to address, but, you know, the um, inward, let's say, matter is something that might come up uh, through an experience. So you have people that are going in for various reasons, uh, perhaps just from, you know, the standpoint of curiosity and, you know, they recognize that they're fine and they're just doing this because they could do it in a, uh, let's say, clinical setting mm -hmm. where everything is safe. But then um, once they have their experience, they recognize where some of those, let's say, attachments or, or, yeah. or you know, I don't want to call them issues, but some of, you know, some personal kind of work that needs to be done that wasn't previously outwardly 
on display. And it's interesting in those uh, studies that are touching those folks who aren't kind of coming in for addiction or any other real specific reason, how many realize that they are holding on to something or do have something to kind of work out. And then they pursue the pathway you know, with, with kind of a fresh perspective saying, yeah, there is Definitely. something I want to work on. Yeah, the, the, this distinction between the healthy normal, the scientific lingo for not mm -hmm. having a disorder or checking off enough boxes to qualify for this disorder. I tell you what, like you get a human being on a high dose of psilocybin under prepared conditions, all those distinctions are just like kind of like obliterated. I mean, just like, you know, the, the or even if like, you know, lots of folks, you know, they're, you know, just there to quit smoking, you know, like that's, you know, <laughs> It's not like, and we've warned people, it's not like, oh, you're telling the experience, oh, this is just about quitting smoking. Like, I mean, a number of times where people, with, and like in that study, because there have been a lot of folks, you know, where trauma, and, and, and the healthy normal studies were trauma from decades ago. Well, just, I mean, I think of one lady that had just had incredible traumatic experiences, uh, severely abused by a spouse decades and decades ago, had to abandon her, an, an infant child, it was so bad you know, that she had to flee really for her life and uh, had never, not only just not worked with a professional, but really had not discussed it with anybody and just the, the sweetest lady. And just like, I just remember how that just... And she came, she was just, healthy, normal, or was she coming? That was a smoking study. So yeah, yeah again, just to quit smoking cigarettes, but it's like, boom. <laughs> like it just, you lift that veil and it's like... Package program. Yeah. It's more than you thought. All right. Yeah, and we try to warn people about this, and sometimes despite our best efforts, like people will still say, I mean, I actually remember one person in that study who had a similar experience who had a tr revisited trauma, and she says, I don't want to deal with this, and she was actually dealing with some stuff in her life. I think her, her parent had gotten ill, and we actually lost contact. She didn't want to, she quit the study, and it, it, it's one of the things you always want to do better at, like, and it's kind of a hard to, because people are, you know, people say, oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I hear you, Doc. You know, like, but it's like, do you really get it? Like, so, like, this is really about, like, this is a whole, like, going to the depths of your, whatever your analogy is, like, yeah. to your psyche. Like, whatever is there, you can't control it. You could pre-qualify the onboarding, but ultimately the medicine heals on its order of priority, not on ours. And so it's, yeah. it's interesting from that standpoint. But, there does um, seem something real to that. Like, and we, as a scientist, you know, like, how do we account for that? Is the medicine, is it, or is it the, that it's unlocked the door or it's lifted this veil? It's, uh, you know, it's allowed for this experience. This, and, and then when those perhaps defense mechanisms are lowered, just, it just, it's just this thing, like, now it can right. finally be resolved and it comes to the surface as a natural kind of healing aspect of the psyche, the same way that the best of medicine is like typically allowing the body to heal itself. Like, you know, we clear out the wound, we clean it, we maybe stitch it together, bring the skin close together. But the real miracle is like, how does my skin know to grow back together? Like, we don't even know like fully how that's <laughs> working in science, like really at the, at the, at the deepest level. And so is it, my presumption is it's something like that in the, why is the mind any different when you set the right conditions where it is safe, where some of these things that have been walled off perhaps are now allowed free reign over the conscious experience uh, you know, of the, the mind. And it just, yeah, again, it just obliterates this idea that like, I mean, like where's the healthy normal? I mean, there is no healthy right. normal. I mean, we're all human. I've never met an enlightened person. I mean, I like human being, if you've lived a certain, like you're going to have trauma, whether you're diagnosable yeah. with PTSD or not. It's like, normal by whose standards really is. That's why it's such a funny yeah. word to use here. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a huge, like a really important point. You're so, making. so what yeah. happens with someone like that after the fact, right? They came in for a session for smoking and you know, their whole uh, world is ripped open. So you discuss it with them, and, and that study is nice in the sense that we have to support their smoke, their, their quitting smoking. We do have several, several weeks of additional weekly contact, weekly meetings, and we try to phase that, you know, to fade into you know less and less talking about the experience and more and more just kind of reinforcing how they're doing with smoking. And um, but but there's so there's some extra time we can keep discussing it. But we do warn people before going into the study, like 
this might um, unearth some stuff. Like that, have a therapist on standby. Exactly. Like, or at least have the ability to and willingness to jump into that if, if, if you feel that you need to afterwards. And, and we'll, you know, in truth, provide you know, we can go, we can provide some extra sessions to help them integrate that weren't necessarily built in the pro, but there's obviously going to be a limit to what we can do. So we try to, you know, war and we can refer people to folks that, you know, might work with them to integrate who aren't going to look at them like they've grown two heads when they say mm -hmm. something really intense happened when I took a psychedelic and a lot of clinicians might just want to pathologize that. Like, what? You took some illicit drug, you know? Yeah, it's said uh, that right. integration is a lifelong process. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, uh, it's an ongoing uh, part of the experience, I think. Yeah. It doesn't stop. And a lot of people will connect the, the trauma to the, to the smoking or whatever. I mean, because at some level, a lot of these things are connected. I mean, smoking plays an incredible role with regulating emotions. And, and, you know, to the degree that you've made some resolution out of some things that haven't been resolved, it's like that's... That's a credible story that like, yeah, that could be some wind in your sail to help you not smoke because you do have some more agency over your emotional life than you did before. Right. But Harry, one of the things um, I've been thinking about recently is that, you know, it's, you're sitting here as a rabbi, very interested in this space. Um, Dr. Johnson is sitting here as a you know, more scientist and for the medical side of things. How can this heal things? But there was an age where the rabbi was the healer. The spiritual person was doing that. Can, can this bring that back? Do you see this as a... I would think so. Um, not that I'm a Christian or I have beliefs in Christianity, but I think our friend Brian um, Murasako, he, he was saying Jesus basically was a shaman. Mm -hmm. He was walking around with his healing drinks and it was people just healing from his uh, ergot backed uh, psychedelic potions. And so, you know, whatever we know about him really came hundreds of years later from the Council of Nicaea in the church. So we don't even have, you know, what the Jesus we know now is not the psychedelic shaman Jesus, but um, the Talmud says that if you're sick or whatever, you go to a sage, you go to a wise man, and we ask the question, like, why not go to a doctor? Like, why does the Talmud tell us to go to a wise man or a sage? And we're taught that most of the illnesses we have are not coming from body issues. It's coming from the soul, from a spiritual issue. That's when you use the word psyche, whatever we want to use. Mm -hmm. That's the root of the sickness, and um, and it's coming out in the body. Even so much so that we say a mitzora, someone in the Torah who gets like this affliction in the body, it's coming from deep within his soul. And the word mitzora, broken into Hebrew, is motzi ra, meaning this person was like talking slander. He was like gossiping and stuff, which caused like an illness in his soul, ah. and it caused uh, the body to become sick from it. Um, so this is kind of the way I look at it and the mystical experience and the psyche and all that is that we're taught that a human is the word Adam in Hebrew, which is made up of two words or two broken down things, it's the Aleph and the word Dam. Aleph represents the divinity, the soul, it's like the one. one. And Dam in Hebrew means blood, it's your body. So we're, a human is just a soul and a body smushed together. And when we have more access to our soul, our brain is like basically a very serious drug dealer. I don't think I've ever realized. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I'm like, wait, my brain holds the keys to the dopamine and serotonin. I'm like, all these drugs, like these cocaines and all these things, target things that my brain has like a warehouse yeah. of that if he wanted to, he could sprinkle. But the mm -hmm. issue is the brain doesn't feel safe. I don't believe so. Um, and because the brain doesn't feel safe, the brain doesn't know what's going on outside of us. It just knows the signals we're sending it from mm -hmm. how we breathe and how we're interacting. It just it's getting signals. So if the brain doesn't feel safe, he's like, no, you don't get to, to have these drugs. You have to survive. There's lions out there. Like, yes. you think I want you to sit in this chair with your eyes closed for 10 hours like you were designed to do and be in a state of peace naturally without having to take a plant? The brain's like, no, you're not safe. Because if you go out and tap out of reality, a lion's going to eat you. So mm -hmm. the brain has to feel very safe. And if the brain feels very safe, it switches out of fight or flight, like frontal cortex. And then your neshama, your soul, your psyche, you're like, oh, this is me. And this is who I really am. And that's where the spiritual experience lies, is when you start to feel safe in your mind and then get access to who you really are. That's a beautiful way to put it. That's because like really making someone feel safe is like seem like the key to preparation. Mm -hmm. 
and it's like safe from the line as part of it. That might be similar to like one level, it's not illegal here. So it's like the cops won't even theoretically couldn't even bust in and get you in trouble at that level. It's the lion is not, you know, that might be the lion might be a metaphor for that. Or back in the day, like literally the so lion. What did the back in the day bring? Right. We still have the same brain that we did 10,000, you know, like, you know, years ago. And, and so you have to be physically safe, but then also, Part of that, we were talking earlier about, like, the emotional safety. Like, like oh, I'm going to feel embarrassed if I cry like a baby. Like, sob, like, mm. in front of these other adults. Like, that's, you don't do that. You don't do that. You know, that's embarrassing. That's, like, that's another level. That's another form of the lion of, like, because if, if we're social outcasts, that's another way. You can be in my lion or you could be, oh, he's crazy. Yeah. yeah, you're you're not part of the group anymore and you're not going to survive long. We're social animals. Well, you had mentioned in our prior conversation potential paranoia over the the guides. Yeah, like if you don't have that, the paranoia over the guides which is something we've rarely seen probably because we do a good job at preparation. I mean, there's no guarantee to avoid a potentially challenging experience what people call a bad trip, which can be very therapeutic in and of itself even that you try to minimize it happening, but the that aspect of like I don't even trust you guys. Are you guys part of a CIA experiment? Uh, did you really? <laughs> am I part of like? Are you doing something? That I bought? Rarely see that. I think probably because of that that good rapport building. Because if you don't have that, like nothing is left. If you don't have a human being that can hold your hand and say, "No, I'm with you. I'm like I really want this to be." you know, good for you, like I care about you, you it's know, crucial. like if that's not there, if they're not feeling that like they're cared for. But it might be tainting the well as well, because to take that control out of the equation renders the individual unto themselves where they could actually find their strength, mm. knowing that they need no one to hold their hand. And so like, you know, similar to the McKenna method where it's a like complete sensory isolation. <laughs> yeah. Is probably Silent the, darkness. Right, it's the purest way to do the medicine. Initially, probably not because we want certain safeguards there. But once an individual understands what they're kind of starting to touch and where they're starting to, let's say, step into their own, um, perhaps, you know, really stripping it away of all safeguards with the exception of, you know, set and setting, so to speak, um, might be the purest way to experience, you know, some of these medicines. Ultimately, you know, from a scientific standpoint, there are nuances that have to be factored into. Um, but there is something to be said to eliminate that hand that's going to reach out and hold yours. Yeah. And, and, and maybe even, and I would say from what I've seen in sessions, like people can even get there, even if the hand is there, if they need it, but oftentimes people don't need it because right. they are. So, it's not black or like maybe you don't need the silent darkness because then if you really like, yeah, he might be in a really, right. you know, and then the paranoia, oh, what if I freak out and then no one's there and then that becomes yeah. a thing. But that gets to a level, it's like ultimately like, I like the way you put like the brain is not safe because yeah. these are all layers. It's like, okay, the cops are going to, the nines aren't going to get me, the cops aren't going to get me, the these other people aren't going to laugh at me. Oh, did you see he looked like a fool, the, the patient, the participant looked like a, you know, it, Wanna, if then you have yourself, you're, right. it, yeah. I want to double down on that for one second. First of all, I fully agree with what you're saying. Like, the ultimate level is to be able to sit by yourself, which in a closet, which is where I, I had my own personal spiritual experience after, you know, in, in high school and college, after all these times of doing it with friends and settings. And yeah. yeah. When you go by yourself and it's just you, that's where you really find what's going on inside. But to get to there, to feel safe enough to do that is probably very... You know, you have to work out your muscles in the psychedelic sure. space, so to say. Right. But just to talk about the brain feeling safe, this, a lot of this came to me when I read a study about this lion thing. So basically, your brain doesn't really know what's going on around us. It knows the signals. Mm -hmm. So if a lion is chasing you in a jungle or something, how are you going to breathe? Like, you're very <laughs> short of breath. So your brain's like, oh, you're breathing this way. You must be, mm. so I'm going to secrete anxiety chemicals and this to, to protect you. Your brain's like, when I'm giving you anxiety, I got your back. Like, yeah, because you need this anxiety chemical to, to get out of this lion situation. So then today, people who aren't being chased by lions, who are just experiencing like struggles in life. They're going to breathe wrong and their brain's going to think something else is happening. that's not really happening. And the brain's like, oh, I'm getting the message that you're not safe. Here's some anxiety chemicals. So it's like you start to loop. Right. And then it hit me when we said the nature of the exile of the Israelites in Egypt, when we hit our lowest level, we were katzer ruach, we were short of breath. That's the term that was used to describe our servitude. It's like we weren't breathing right. So if I'm taking huh. deep breaths, 
guess what? My brain's like, you you may be safe right now. Mm -hmm. So if you're mm -hmm. safe, I'll give you a little more, more access to what I could do for you. And that was like one thing that really hit me of like just telling people like just breathe. And like I know you always say it's in the breath. Like right. I got that. <laughs> like I hear his voice in my head saying it's in the breath, Harry. It's okay. Um, the trick is to get uh, folks to understand that we should not be using the breath reactively mm. because it's already too late. You're caught, right? You have to start building this practice of proactively mm. working with the breath so that way whatever environmental factors do occur and they will occur, you're already in a state of, let's say, chill and safety. Yeah. Right, because ultimately we look to the breath almost like we look to medicine. I have to get sick first to use the medicine. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you're gonna have a very hard time falling into a deep, calm breath if you're already reacting to some environmental cue that's got you kind of jacked up. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to work with this tool preemptively. Um, very, very important, but it is all in the breath. Ultimately, we just don't understand how deep that cuts. I like that. And uh, just one more thing I wanted to say on this brain feeling safe idea. Um, because, you know, I was, you spoke about the pornography addictions and stuff. And when I was in college and trying to go into my Torah life, I was dealing with this battle and I was wondering, so why does the brain make it feel so good to spill your seed and have these experiences? And then I realized our brain's really, its goal is to, for us to survive. So obviously we know if it doesn't feel good, we're not going to procreate, but it's deeper than that. Because let's say, what's going to happen if I'm an 80 year old man and I don't have like a big family or whatever. Back then, 5,000 years ago, whatever assets I have, the neighboring tribe is gonna simply come and, and kill me and take all my gold mm. and rape my woman and take them all. Mm. So my brain, when I'm like 19, 20 years old, it's like, Harry, I have your back. You don't realize you're gonna be 80 one day and you're not gonna be able to wipe yourself even. So now I'm gonna make this thing feel amazing. You're gonna go spread your seed everywhere and guess what? You'll have 10 kids who had 10 kids who had 10 kids and when you're 80, <laughs> you'll be the patriarch. So just like you blink when I throw a ball at your face, you didn't control that blink. So it's like your brain's like, I got your back, I'm gonna blink for you. So my brain's like, Harry, I got your back. I'm gonna make this thing feel amazing so you can have as many kids so you're safe. So I work with a lot of people on seed retention because it's a very spiritual damaging thing, the pornography today in America. Mm -hmm. So like men have to learn how to retain their seed and be strong with it and use it appropriate times within their wife and their family. So I explain to people, all the while you keep spilling your seed, your brain is still convinced you're in a narrative where you need to have 10 kids, who have 10 kids, who have 10 kids. You don't feel safe yet. You didn't hit your patriarchy 80 year old self where you're safe. But when you start to hold it in and retain it, your brain's like, Oh, so I'm getting, because you're not spilling it, you must feel already safe. That's how your right. brain's logic works. So I'm like, if you're interested in chilling, just breathe right. You know, do a little seed retention. These are two already major life hacks to convince your brain that you're safe. And when your brain feels you're safe, this, this planet's a pleasant place. So you see place. that as not yeah. pleasure seeking, but a fear response? Yes. Your really? brain is making it feel good, so you will well, trick you to You're throwing Hail safe. Marys. I mean, essentially, <laughs> right. like in a sense that like, I'm gonna, which is actually some animals will do this, like in their close of death, the male will just like ejaculate yes. because it's like, who knows, it might land in the right spot to make am something I, happen. Yeah, I, but of I'm course, and it's like, that's not going to happen when you're staring at a screen and, you know, like, obviously it's not even. But it's both. I think yeah. it's not, you know, exclusively pleasure seeking at the same time. It's, it's not, you know, know, exclusively yeah. the opposite. It's, it's probably both and more. Right. Um, yeah. Our brain makes it pleasure seeking because otherwise we wouldn't do it. Right. Yeah. Going back to um, what you mentioned about Adam, right? The one, right? The soul with the, the godly soul with uh, the, the human being, the blood. So according to what you're saying, right? That most things derive from a, a soul problem, a psyche problem, whatever language you want to use for, for the ineffable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever language you want to use for that. It would make sense why a spiritual experience would be so healing. Yes, because once you have that, where you feel like, because the reality of the soul is it's all good. God is good. This world's good. Everything's good. So once you, once you're in your soul, you see that. And once everything's good, it just filters right through your whole body in all your ways because people get sick from their anxiety, from their worries, from all these things, and they bottle it up and it comes out. But if everything's all good, I'm not holding on to anything. I can let go and trust the ride. And once you can trust the ride, your body will follow suit, I think. Right, so it's yeah. not too dissimilar uh, from the 12 steps. I know when I joined it, I had a lot of discomfort, how it was compatible with Judaism until I came across a book written by a rabbi and connecting the two. But oftentimes it's, 
that was what was healing about the 12 steps that I guess is what's healing about psychedelics is that spiritual framework that it introduces. Yeah, you go out of fight or flight, so the default place you are when you're not in fight or flight is your soul. And once you get to acquaint yourself with your soul or your psyche, whatever it is, it has a language and an information set that's beyond words. It's a knowledge of goodness. You know. You right. Feel. So what you're so what you're saying, kind of the message you're resonating, is that this is not a um, a sacrifice we're making in order to heal. Like this is Judaism. Like this is exactly what it's what it's all about. This is Judaism, and there's a way that humans were able to have these experiences without having to go into the earth to cause it to happen. Just by the fact seeing these chemicals are endogenously produced in my own brain, I know that I'm a drug dealer to myself. Right. And we just lost the way. And that makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I say, I haven't seen anything in almost 20 years of working with psychedelics that I have not seen or know from good evidence in the world that it happens without. I've never seen anything that can happen with a psychedelic that doesn't, like, not as frequently, and, you know, but that can't happen without it. Like, qualitatively, it's not like these are psychedelic experiences. These are human experiences, like when they're really genuine. And when, it, when a session really goes well, it, people aren't coming about it talking like a TV show or a movie, like, oh, now I know what psilocybin does. It's like, well, when they're talking about, oh, now I know something about myself. Now I know something, you know, like, the, it's not about the psilocybin, it's about... You know, it's the way the chemist Sasha Shulgin put it when he first tried mescaline. He devoted the rest of his life to studying psychedelics. It's like, how could that, like, a half gram of a white powder do that to me? And it's like sort of, I'm the heavier hitter in that interaction. You know, the human <laughs> brain, the human body versus, like, you know, pretty simple molecule, white powder. Like, clearly that unlocks something, but all of the really interesting things happened because of me. And so, yeah, these, the idea that mystical experiences happen without psychedelics, the idea that these philosophical lessons can become upon. But yeah. you're saying psychedelics allow you to kind of time it, measure it, predict it. Yeah, but these and are make, things that make are it more accessible, kind of get you there a little more easy. Um, but it doesn't necessarily make it easy. It can kind of give you a crash course and that might be really, really difficult, right. but, you know... Right, it's not easy. But, but it can kind of speed I things give, up. Um, an analogy on this just quickly. They said, for thousands of years, our sages said that this Messiah or this Mashiach, whoever comes at the end of days to redeem humanity, he comes riding on a donkey. And there's a lot of different interpretations. He's a humble person, not a humble person, but I heard something mm -hmm. beautiful that... What is a donkey, first of all? A donkey is something that takes you on a journey that you can't go on without your own, like... There's places in Afghanistan I'd love to hike, but without a, two weeks on a donkey, it would take me like a year or two. So the Hebrew word for donkey is chamor, which is the same Hebrew root as chomer, the physicality, the material. So it means like in the times of this messianic era or the world peace era, however you want to describe it, we use the physicality to go on journeys that normally would have been accessible for humans without this physicality, <laughs> but now we have to go into the physical world to do it. And it's, Books written on how and why, but yeah. So it's not, the psychedelic isn't it. It's the where you can get to. But it happens to be, it's just the donkey. It could take you there a little bit quicker. I mean, and maybe right. the psychedelics are a little, for more people, the psychedelics are more helpful now because we're not spending every night staring up into the Milky Way. Correct. Like, you know, and we're staring at screen. So much of our reality is this kind of human-made, highly processed thing and we're getting further, we're further away from our extended family, we're further away from the natural world, and so may, we just have a greater divide to, to yeah. breathe. And they also right. say that the, 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 the Jews or the Israelites in Egypt, they hit, hit their rock bottom, the lowest they possibly could have gotten before they peaked and got to the highest they could have gotten. Mm. So this is like kind of where humanity finds itself today, so far removed from the inside of our brain and feeling safe that we're like, have to do this like radical, like, Intervention. intervention, yeah. <laughs> mm. Like the, the, mm -hmm. when you shock the heart, you know, it's like got to yeah. wake, wake us up. Yeah. It's interesting that, you know, we're pointing back to kind of historical use and application. So where does that fit into the current uh, scientific perspective in terms of we understand that 
some of these plant medicines have been around for a very long time, used endogenously, um, pardon me, indigenously uh, by various cultures that have very specific methodology in terms of their application, right? Like the use of shamans and the use of ikros and, uh, you know, various kind of um, protocols, right, that were provided to ensure that the individual had the safest, most meaningful experience. Um, is that creeping back into the lab, meaning are we studying perhaps some of the, um, are we studying some of the The software ancient, components? Not the software components, but how some of these kind of ancient applications were um, applied, frankly. Like, um, are we looking at individuals having these experiences in a more kind of, uh, let's say, shamanic way? Mm -hmm. um, is there different data that's coming out from those studies? Uh, what, what's, you know, is there a space even for that to be studied again? Perhaps maybe there is, and, and we've seen it and experienced it, um, you know, how um, some of these, let's say, classical ways of using these tools would yield greater benefit, perhaps, than just doing it in a dry, scientific, clinical mm -hmm. way. Right, meaning to study, say, take 50 people and put them in a clinical setting in a, you know, white room in a hospital, and then another 50 in nature or in a maloka or the way a TP tent, maybe the way, you know, indigenous tribes do peyote or things like that, yeah. and then measure the experience. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that hasn't happened yet, but that's, that would be a, a really cool experiment to, <laughs> to do. So there have been studies of, uh, particularly with ayahuasca, of, of you, know, you know, with the syncretic churches in, in Brazil that are using ayahuasca, there have been studies. Of, of those folks using in a traditional way. And um, in fact, there's some research using ayahuasca to treat a, um, depression that looked promising, that very much in line with the results with psilocybin, which it's not surprising given the, you know, the pharmacologically they're very similar. Um, but, you know, with more of a traditional ayahuasca, you know, sacramental use. So there's certainly a lot to be done, but there have been investigations and, you know, you know, documenting the claimed benefits of, of, uh, of, of yeah, you do get. Now, now I don't think we have the science to say to actually make that comparison, because there's a whole lot of things you got to control, like dose. You want to make sure the same dose is is given, right. and um, right. And when you start doing that, then it goes outside of the shamanic. Like the right, because they're like, you the can't measure the dose. Like, what are you talking about? I put the amount in that I'm called to, you know, <laughs> right. by the plant spirits to put in there. And that's what I put in there. It's like, well, no, no, we got to run that through GC mass spec first. And then we get a, <laughs> the appropriate control condition in the on the couch right. in the clinic, you know. To So <laughs> there's a bit of a challenge there. but And there's science of, like, say, just doc. I think it's very valuable, like, the documenting the results. Like, for example, in the addiction world, just the... The, the high rates of addiction recovery associated with, you know, you name it, the Native American church, the UDV, Santo Daime, and these various traditions that, you know, now they don't have the rigor of the experimental, like it could have been just the non, you know, like the, you know, not the sacrament, it could be like all of the other, it's a well, whole What are they package. finding in those? Well, just that, like I said, like very high rates of recovery. There's lots of stories of someone in, I, that I find very, very credible saying like I was killing myself, drinking myself to death or doing cocaine. You, know, you name the substance and they clean themselves up through these traditions, through this sacramental use of and, and, and sometimes in a very salient way. It's like, no, no, no. The peyote told me like you know, the peyote came and told me like you're going to die. Cut this out like. Boom, or the ayahuasca told, you know, people, um, Graham uh, Hancock, the author, said he, ayahuasca told him, like, yeah, you need to stop doing cannabis and under no uncertain terms. It's like, you're done with this. It's going to lead to death for you. Like, you need to stop, you know? And so people, you know, I find those credible, you know, accounts. And given what I've seen in laboratory research and given what we know about psychedelics, that you know, and you, yeah, you can't, you don't have that level of control where you can divorce it from how much of that was the, you know, was the sacramental setting and the belief system. It's like, who knows, but I'd bet any amount of money that the sacrament, that the pharmacology of that, you know, whether it's the DMT or the, you know, mescaline, like, was a heavy hitter, was at least a big part of that package in combination with the, 
with the setting and the intention and the belief systems. Um, so, you know, you do as much science surrounding the traditions that you can to help document, say, hey, like we need, and this goes back to the, I mean, there were reports in the, well, how early, like at least in the early 60s of the, you know, you know peyote using uh, tribes that, like, hey, these, even in the day where people were saying, oh, this is like some satanic cult, like literally, you know, you know, researchers, anthropologists saying, uh, no, there's like, there's some incredible stories about people overcoming alcoholism, which is, you know, and historically very, you know, big issue with Native American culture, with the, especially the introduction of alcohol from the Europeans that just really decimated a lot of people. There hadn't been those traditions of moderate use that there's kind of a case to be made that that's a pattern for addictive substances across the planet where they're introduced like right away without like the decades and centuries of the lessons of, okay, if you're going to use this, this is how you moderate it, you know, use it at the dinner table, whatever, different traditions. Right, that's true. Even with alcohol, we don't think about that, but there are ways that just in the culture we're instructed to moderate this. Yeah, and typically in cultures where it's more of like, oh yeah, the men go off together and get blasted like by themselves, it's like they don't do as well as the cultures. That, they have more problems, relatively speaking, than the cultures where it's like, no, it's, it's around the dinner table with the family. And it's like, you know, there are differences in these. No, any way we look of, at it, it would be bizarre if we had a bottle of booze on the table right now. Yeah, yeah. And it's like things like, oh, kind of early, you know. And right. Like, yeah, like outside. those right. those traditions, you know, right. I think help to keep us on track. And then it's funny, you see culture kind of going the other way. It's about interesting. I don't know if it's increased, but over the last decade or so, it's just like, you know, mimosa brunches and all of that. It's like there's these kind of ways. It's like, well, you can drink in the morning, but not look. So, well, it's it's mimosas and it's like bloody marys. Like that's okay because it's more. Like, yeah, you're still kind of getting sauced in the morning. <laughs> like, you know, whereas a hundred years ago, it was like more common for like, you know, folks to just that was kind of part of the deal. You know, it's, that's kind of what led to the inclination for prohibition. It's like, you know, a lot of the guys just. Took a snootful in the morning and spent as much of your day like that as you could. Yeah. Right. Then it's almost like traditions that form around it, right? Being more careful with driving. That's something that most people understand, whether everyone keeps to it. Most people understand that's not something we do with driving. If it's just yeah. introduced, you know, you introduce to society cars and alcohol on the same day. You know? Right, right. <laughs> and then the cultural tradition of even the designated driver, like since the 80s, uh, actually spoke with this group about psychedelics, this, what are they called, pop shift, that they actually had a, from the tradition of, apparently it was like, I think an episode of Cheers, of all things, like the TV show from the 80s, like that played a big role in actually starting the seed growing culturally of like a, a designated driver as a thing. Right. And like oh, that, like that yeah. wasn't a thing back in the 70s. Like no one, like what, designated driver? One person's like, not going to drink? Why would you do that to them? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and so now it's a thing, you know. It's like you're not crazy for saying, oh, who's going to not drink tonight if you're Today's really going out drinking friend. a lot? Yeah. My, so let's bring it, let's invite a sober friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <This is terrible. laughs> yeah, so do you see, in terms of the pace things are moving at, right? Obviously, you've been at this for 20 years. Um, Consider what we just spoke about with tradition and you know, having the right protections around introducing new um, substances or, you know, powerful tools into society. You think it's moving too quickly, too slowly? It's, you know, in different ways, yes and yes. <laughs> you know, like, you know, because it's so complex. Like, frankly, I think the, you know, the, the, the medical approval, it's going too slowly. Although I don't want to jump past the, I think we need to go through... The, the lack of funding for this research has been a limitation, and so it's, it, things have gone way too slow. We should have already been where we're at now years ago, but you know here we are, and and so I hope things keep proceeding, and that that FDA regulates things in a, a smart way, and that it proceeds towards medical approval. I hope that the politics don't get in the way. Um, at the same time, I do think that. We're going to see some weird stuff as things are. We're going to see, you know, um, you know, doctors, sla you know, shaman um, that are doing things that, you know, you name it, sex cults, you know, like different, you know, things where it's like things are look untowards and like abuses and like there is an incredible power which anyone knows who's been in, in these spaces that has worked with, especially someone providing the substance that 
It's a heavy trip, pun intended, to be associated with like what can be the most meaningful experience of someone's life. I mean, I can't believe it myself. Like that, I, me, like, <laughs> have been in the room, like a number of times when people have said this is like one of, and a number of times like the most important thing that's ever happened to them. Like what? Right, and naturally they may attribute like, something to you. Yes. Right. You've seen that. And you could, yes, and you could take advantage of that. I've seen people, mm -hmm. you know, fall in love with researchers or, or have an infatuation and, or with the clinicians or. Or even less, you know, and that obviously can lead to, depending on your clinical boundaries, like, you know, to really dangerous kind of boundary, you know. So one of the things with these substances that can dissolve, these experiences can dissolve boundaries. I think it's all the more reason to have really important boundaries in that container so that the person feels safe. So, you know, if it's a well, person of any type, but particularly, you know, for a woman that she doesn't feel like she's going to be, you know, sexually you know, abuse or this isn't developed into some sort of relate, like what are the real intentions of this person? You know, if you start like crossing some boundaries and, and so that's really, really important. So it's, I think it's, it's gonna get really complex. I think it's overall gonna be a good thing, but it's, it's sort of like computers or any, it's like. Yeah, we yeah, misuse it's, most new technology um, until we recognize the misuse and start to regulate, but it's different here because this technology has an innate intelligence within it that uh, perhaps could, you know, realign misuse. But it hasn't always. It hasn't always, no, but um, it's the one thing that separates this level of tech from all the previous tech, in my opinion, that we've typically misused when it hit the scene. It's like where, you know, children playing with power tools, you know, the power tools mm -hmm. is fantastic, but in the wrong hands, it's going to cause a lot of damage. But this power tool has certain, um, you know, guardrails built into it just because of the intelligence within these antigens. Um, but to your point, you know, it always, it's not necessarily on display always, but you hope that it will be there to kind of, um, you know, regulate itself, so to speak. You see, what, right. was that, what was the documentary about the yoga guy? Was it called Bikram or something, the Netflix documentary? Something about um, the guy who founded mm. Bikram Yoga. Um, I forget what it was called. I don't yoga remember guy. the name, but yeah. yes, it was. It I was, don't know if you watch it, but it, it shows so. how he, so he introduced Bikram Yoga to the West in many ways and found a lot of, a lot of uh, centers was behind it. But he also used that and the power that was in the yoga and the breath and the you know, experiences that he's able to take people on to um, create a sort of guru complex and abuse yeah. people in the process. A lot of people, a lot of people. Yeah, and so that there's... pops up in different traditions and, you know, and especially in, in wherever you have a, an exclusive, you know, mm -hmm. where like secrecy surrounding it. And if, you know, someone has sort of, they're the exclusive conduit to whatever you call it, Correct. God, the divine. Exactly. It's just humans are humans, and even if the majority, you know, navigate that responsibly, some percentage are right, going to take advantage of that. And, like, we're going to see some of that here. And hopefully there is, I mean, there's certainly a part where, for a lot of people, there is this, you know, people do feel they come upon lessons of, like, you know, connection and empathy. But you also see counter, and you also see Charles Manson using psychedelics to brainwash people and right. the CIA you know, exploring it to bring, and in fact, there's some reason not definitive to suspect those may not be separate, that Charles Manson may have been part of the CIA's investigations Different in terms podcast. of, yeah, 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 that can go down a rabbit hole, a great book called Chaos, um, like focused on, on that, uh, really intriguing, but so yeah, who knows, it's going to be messy though, like it's, you know, it's like the, you know, computers led to, you know, Pornography right, like, and everything, you know, like, you know, Silk Road and people could hire a hitman to like <laughs> all these horrible things, you know, but it's also, you know, obviously improved our lives and, you know, and still may the AI might kill us is, is the recent conversation. <laughs> right. So I, we still, to be continued, you know, out, right? I don't think right. the psychedelics are going to, you know, end civilization, but. Um, no, but I think it's important that you're yeah. saying this because a lot of people want to, um, will want to say, okay, so this is a good thing and it has to be good in all cases for everyone, every time in order for it to be acceptable. Isn't there that one story that, well, of course, is going to be a story of everything with this? Right, like you're going to have cases of where the, oh yeah, the shaman ended up raping 
one of the women at the retreat, you know, like that stuff is gonna happen. And so just, we all say you have to recognize humans are humans and we have to, yeah, have systems in place, you know, balanced with human freedom, but like a recognition that, you know, power can corrupt and that, you know, and hopefully ways to identify who's doing the good work and who is, you know. Right. And, and once things come out of the shadow, then you're more likely to have, you know, like, yeah, the Yelp for shaman. Like, yeah, this one that people are saying, like, yeah, watch out for them. This guy gets kind of creepy. Or, you know, they're just always trying to sell you something more, or, like, whatever. And, the, you know, and then this one, like, oh, yeah, a million people have said, wow, this is one of the most genuine people I've ever met in life. Like, maybe we'll go to this one, you know? Right. Like, <laughs> right. So, say eventually some of those things will be sorted out. Yeah. I mean, yes. So you bring up AI, enough. and I think that's a critical point. We have to make sure that AI has a therapeutic psychedelic experience. It's very important. <laughs> you know, I've actually been talking with a friend and colleague about exploring, you know, that, like, how to, like, build in this, like, maybe model something like a psychedelic experience into right. the neural networks. Like, maybe you need that, like, the human right. being might That's why these benefit. conversations like a, are important. <laughs> like a refresh, get out of the default mode network. <laughs> I think the AI yeah, is a fight with light. The AI doesn't feel safe. We but just a fact. <laughs> right. Like maybe it will say, maybe I won't decide to kill humanity in my first microsecond of consciousness. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good know. point because it has this historical <laughs> reference. So why should it feel safe? It sees what we've been doing, right? right. But if these conversations kind of really start to uh, come to the mainstream and they're captured by all the data scraping tools that are out there, then you are basically dosing AI with this potentiality right. of what it is to have a therapeutic psychedelic experience. And then it starts mm. to be able to model that into its you know, cognitive programming and now you have uh, a healthier AI, potentially. So what we're doing right in this conversation, <laughs> this which will it. be on the internet, right. will help to... Yeah. That's what he's saying. We'll yeah, be scraped up. Yeah. Right I, mean, I feel better about myself That's now. Really like, you know, we like, did something. <laughs> right, we are programming the AI. If the AI That's gets wind, that 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 humans can That's be saved. Right. Right. Push right. the microphone. Right. Oh. Oh, for sure. You're programming the AI. 100%. Right. And I guess that... Chills. Okay, then when you think That's of that true. technology, then everything being connected here starts making a lot more sense. Here we are. Okay. In search of more. We just found it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Uh, Thank you, Doctor. Oh. Really appreciated these you. both conversations. They're excellent. All right. Final that was words, awesome. Oh, uh, no, that was, that was a ton of fun. Thank you for coming oh, down. Thank you. Final, words, final words, final words. Oh, yeah. really, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yes, final beautiful. Words, um, first of all, it's obviously a big honor and an amazing time to have these conversations. Just like one last question. Because so we're, while we're training AI, is it safe to say that there's not such a thing as a human being a healer, but the plants are the healers? Or is this like... Yeah. We're all healers. Does that make sense to say? Well, that's yeah. why we need to get out of the way. Yeah. Right. And that's the name of your yes. podcast. Because uh, it's all happening, and uh, to the degree that I think I am, I am the block. That's it. So the AI should just pick all this up and do it, get to work. Okay. And we'll also make mention <laughs> of the the man who put this together, Tyler. So thank you, Tyler, thank for you, Tyler. Uh, organizing this, reaching out to the Johnson, and Harry, and Danny. Beautiful. Time, time.